Okay, folks, welcome back. All right, so we are looking at a, another discussion and lecture on institutional order flow. And before I get into it, uh, I borrowed this from a another YouTuber. Uh, it's not important who it is, and I'm not saying that there's anything inherently bad about the other YouTuber. Uh, I'm not trying to sow discord or anything like that, but I do see a growing number of you in the comment section and folks that email me and or reach out to me through TradingView, the idea of order flow using a DOM, which is a depth of market, which is over here on the left-hand side. Then you have the footprint, which is in the middle of the screen here. See all these little, look real technical, right? That's institutional. <laughs> And all this down here, wow, that really makes your chart look amazing. Uh, when I was younger, I would have loved to have added all that on top of every other indicator I had on my chart. Okay, because uh, it would have made me feel like I was smarter and more informed. And I want you to think about what it is you're learning from me. Okay, if you're new or if you've been with me for a little bit of time, um, it can seem a little daunting. Uh, a little complicated, if you will, uh, and it's because you're trying to rush through the process. And if I were to ask you to look at this, here, look at this information, um, what should you do with all this? Now, I know how to use this information. I know how other people use it, and I have friends, and I also have students that use things like this in concert with what it is that I do, and they are profitable. So I'm not trying to discourage you from using these tools because if you feel like it helps you if it's advantageous for you it helps you trust your model everything I'm saying here today if you feel uneasy watching the video just turn it off okay I'm trusting that you're all adults here you can see through what it is I'm trying to convey I'm answering the question of do I see the necessity for these types of things in trading and, and the short answer that way for folks that want to know right away and not waste any more time, um, I don't believe that it's necessary to know these things. In fact, uh, I'm going to talk about why these are no different than any other indicator out there uh, because it's a faith-based premise that has to be applied to everything, whether it's my content, my concepts, somebody else's stuff, or even this. Um, you know, institutions that may subscribe to these types of things here, um, it doesn't make prices go up and down. The only thing really you're doing is with the left-hand side over here, you know, the DOM, depth of market. Uh, when you see orders coming forward on that display, they can be spoofed. Okay, Spoofing is where an order can be placed above or below the marketplace and pulled away before the market prints it. And it will look like, it'll make it look like there's more buying or selling interest in a particular market. So how would that be any more advantageous or different, really, for a trader to have to sit down, look at the market, and determine it's going to run from where we are right now at the market price to some previous support level. So in other words, you expect it to go lower. Or it's going to go higher to some previous resistance level. Okay, so you're still met with that same challenge of knowing what? You need to know where the market's going to go. Okay, and there's so many people out there trying to be educators, trying to be an influencer, trying to convince other people they can trade. They are stating these terms here. You don't have to predict the market. You don't have to know where the market's going. And this to me makes absolutely no sense. Okay, it makes no sense whatsoever because if you're looking at the depth of market over here, and the idea is that you think that there is a more likely, okay, this is what you're going to have to subscribe to using these types of tools. What's more likely? That the market will start to go down to eat into the orders that are below the marketplace? Or is it more likely to go higher to eat into the orders that are above the marketplace? Well, I, I'm, I'm not concerned about those small little fluctuations in price. I mean, if you're sitting here trying to make you know, two handles, three handles, those types of trades, you know, and that's your mechanism to, to do those types of things. I'm not going to sit here and try to shoot holes through that because this is simply, I would, I would never do that. 
Okay, I'm not interested in that type of trading. I'm interested in knowing where the market's going to reach to, and I teach my students to focus on that primarily in the early stages of their development. Depth of market or level two data requires you still to have an opinion, and that opinion may be incorrect. Much like my opinion about the marketplace using my own concepts may, may be incorrect. Just like anybody else, we're, we're still met with the challenge of knowing the first rule and goal that I teach my students, which is to know where you trust that the market is more likely to draw to, higher or lower. And not just for the sake of a, a few handles because the depth of market may imply that there's more buyers or sellers at any given time. Just because there may be printing a depth of market ladder, which is what these things are called over here, these are ladders, there may be more orders stacking above marketplace or below the marketplace. And the idea generally is it's more likely, doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it's more likely that the market will gravitate towards where the larger stacking of orders, if it's more likely that it's going to go higher then the justification should be made that you know the depth of market the level two data that ladder should show a lot more orders to the upside and then when it gets there it should eat into that and start eroding those orders uh, that to me is something that is synonymous with having a crutch and that's not to be derogatory i don't, I don't mean it in, in a sense that you know nobody should use crutches you know, while they're learning or while they're using their model. If you feel like these things are helpful to you and it helps you focus on sticking to one side of the marketplace, if you have a bias, if you have a, a draw on liquidity that you feel is going to be booked for that particular trading session or, or that day, uh, and this helps you stay focused on it, then that's there's nothing to be worried about. There's nothing wrong about that. In my opinion, and this is all it is, and you have, hopefully – you can permit me to have my own opinion here. But the idea of using this stuff for the sole basis of whether you should be a buyer or seller is a little bit myopic, regardless of whether or not an XYZ trading firm or institution or bank or whatever um, has them on their terminals in their trading floor. It's irrelevant. The market still has that puzzle of where is it going to go? higher or lower. And when I teach my students to focus on where the most likely draw on liquidity is going to be, that's what you should be focusing on. Not all these little numbers in here on a footprint or over here worrying about is there more buyers or sellers above the marketplace and it's likely to keep going up. And I, I watch a lot of YouTubers that use these types of tools over here like the depth of market, the DOM. It's DOM, not DOM. <laughs> But the uh, the idea of using it, uh, if you watch any YouTubers that uh, have it on their charts or they're live streaming or maybe they recorded their, their trades and they still have it on there, um, it doesn't appear, at least from my observations, it doesn't appear that it's all that helpful. You know, Even when I can see the market is likely to go higher or lower and I'm viewing them live streaming or watch you know, something in the past when I can see what the market has done because I've either traded it or I can pull it up in chart form. I can see how they can be tricked into thinking, oh, this I think it's going to go to this price because there's a lot of orders around that price. And I want you to think about how what it is I'm teaching you. Uh, we're not looking at the necessity for these types of things to confirm anything because my assumptions are you're allowing the market to be seen visually in chart form and yes through a time-based chart there's a lot of advantages if you understand what it is i'm teaching there's a lot of advantages to using a time-based chart where some other individuals out there that don't have a subscription to the same view that i have uh, may not like a time-based chart and they have to augment that data and create a new format of a bar or a candle or something to that effect so just know going into this discussion, I will be stating why I am not a fan of this information or these tools. Do not let me change your mind if it feels like it helps you. 
if you're profitable and you feel comfortable using them just because I may be your mentor don't let me pry these things out of your hand you may grow out of them on your own over time or you may stick with them and it may be part of your repertoire and there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're using them in a capacity that allows you to focus and allows you to trust your model if that's what you're using them for there's absolutely zero hindrances there's nothing I would never say anything adversely about it but for someone to come out and say this is this is how you read institutional order flow this is this is, no, you're reading order flow but institutional order flow is not this is not institutional order flow to me this is this reporting numbers that can be spoofed that means that they can pull those orders that means that you may see them flash on the screen but doesn't necessarily mean when price gets to it that those orders are still there many trading firms and quote unquote institutions have been fined many many times over some of them are repeat offenders some of these trolls I've had over the years are actually guilty of this <laughs> and they were penalized for spoofing messing around with placing orders in to make it look like there's a more stronger interest to buy or sell a particular vehicle or instrument or market and if there's an opening for manipulation to the data and that can absolutely be done here how can you really in my opinion this is my opinion now I'm not trying to convince you to not use these things but this is my opinion how can you trust the basis of this data if it absolutely can be manipulated if it can be manipulated to make it look like there is a fake buying interest where orders can be placed above the market price or below the market price and the interpretation of that would be seen collectively in retail trading as there's a lot of a lot of orders below or below the marketplace and the tendency is to trust that it's going to more likely go to where there are more orders and that's not necessarily what happens now I'm sure some of you that use this stuff that don't like me you're gonna come out with you know, ten different examples of where look where it worked look where it worked. but I, I promise you I can go on a live stream and show this stuff and it not working where my stuff is absolutely running circles around it so permit me to say that in this video and I promise I won't be any more derogatory than that but now from this point on I want to kind of show you and compare and contrast what it is I'm trying to focus on in my teaching so that way you're as a student you're looking at it the right way and if you feel like or you feel pressured by other people that will say you're, you're not learning real order flow no we're not messing around with these things here that's true because it's not necessary because I want you to understand something listen to the name of this stuff here okay the footprint that means you're looking at something that's already happened how many orders were in this part of the candle this part of the bar okay it's already happened where have I ever told you to go into charts and say here is how many buyers and sellers have been so repeat what they've done or use that information you never heard me say that I'm always telling you to predict where price is going to go and then where you think it's going to go that draw on liquidity above the marketplace or below the marketplace it's going to go up to take out buy stops or it's going to go up to reprice to an inefficiency some kind of fair value gap or SIBI could be a volume imbalance it could be a institutional order flow entry drill you know, it could be a consequent incursion of a wick there's very specific things that we're looking for but not every single market at that time frame in that chart fractal that portion of price that you're studying is going to have every single thing that I have as a PD array something that I teach you to focus on but the ones that are actually there you have to consider them and know what to do with them and navigate them so I'm teaching you absolutely how to predict price because how else are you going to use this information and trust it I'll pose the question to you like this if you are bearish on the marketplace 
doesn't it make sense that if you're going to be using these tools that you're expecting the depth of market to show a lot more orders below the marketplace, a lot more interest to draw price into lower prices because your bias, your directional bias, your analysis, you are bullish or bearish. So you're going to go in into this data looking for those things to justify what? Your, your analysis. So I don't go to the middleman. These are all middleman ideas to me. And it's helpful in the beginning if you don't know what you're doing and, and how to navigate price action and you want to see the underpinnings of what the market's doing and how it books price. That's wonderful. But my PD arrays are always ahead of this. It's always ahead of it. Look at what I did this week with the analysis on the July 9th, 2023 video I did on Sunday before the market opened up. I told you exactly what we would be seeing. I told you what would be expected in terms of price delivery, and it delivered perfectly, flawlessly. No necessity on having any of this stuff here. So really, I want you to compare and contrast. If this is measuring minute by minute, second by second, real events of transactions, because that's what this all this is showing you is transactions. But just because there was a certain number of buyers or sellers at a particular price at any given time, and just because there are more orders above or below the market price in the DOM, has absolutely no bearing on future price it has absolutely no bearing on the future direction of price. The market could stay stagnant and stay just consolidating. When this stuff was a big buzz when I first started using it, when level two became a thing, and I'm old enough and I watched the transition from open outcry into electronic trading. When these tools were made available to us, everybody was clamoring to it because level two, that was the thing. You were really informed if you had this information. Where's all the yachts? Where's, every, where's all the billionaires and the millionaires? If it was going to make you institutional minded, where's all the rich people that came up out of nowhere using it? Right. So not to discourage you. But when I say institutional order flow, it's not this. You know, you'll you'll hear people say, um, ICT doesn't teach order flow. I don't teach this stuff because this stuff I have no faith in, and I know how to use it. But I completely cut it out of my analysis because I don't need it. You might need it. You may find helpfulness from it. It may allow you to feel closer to the marketplace. And if that's what you're feeling by doing it, then there's nothing wrong with that. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. Like I've already stated earlier, I have friends in this industry and I have students that use this stuff in conjunction with what I'm teaching and they're profitable. So I'm not here to say this doesn't work. Okay. What I'm doing is I'm drawing a stark contrast between when I say institutional order flow, what am I talking about in contrast to this stuff here? That's what we're going to do. Okay. So let's move on into the, the discussion here. We're going to look at a case study on NASDAQ. Okay. And I'm going to spare you level two data because it's not required. It's not necessary. And I want you to think about how it is that I teach you and how I've shown a plethora of examples of before the fact where the market's going to go, how it's going to get there. Not just here we are at point A. I believe it's going to maybe get up to point B. That's not what I say. I say it, this is where I think the draw of liquidity is. That means I'm co-signed. That's a directional bias. That means I have made my expectations known publicly beforehand. And it's not a two pip or five handle expectation. These are pretty considered price moves. And I'm not utilizing anything that is classically lumped into order flow. Because folks that use that information, when I say I'm trading with institutional order flow, I'm seeing 
institutional order flow in price action. And I'm going to cover that again today. I've done it in the past, but I want to present a little bit deeper presentation about it. And I want you to think about the, the lack of required tools that other people, other traders, feel like they have to have. When I have nothing on my chart, it's simply a candlestick chart. And I'm, as long as I can see what time it is and where we are in the range, that's it. Uh, that's all you need. So the number one thing is draw on liquidity. So I was bullish. Obviously, I mentioned that last Sunday. And today is July 16th, 2023 at the time of this recording. So last Sunday, July 9th, 2023, I had outlined my expectation of higher prices on E-mini S&P, NASDAQ, higher prices on Euro dollar, and lower prices on the dollar index. And it was a clean sweep. Everything delivered as I expected. They were not small moves. They were rather large. And I want to go into detail as to why I believed that NASDAQ would go higher. And I want you to take a look at the chart here. Upper left-hand corner, this is the weekly chart. This right here, this candle right here, is a mitigation block. Now, I don't talk too much about it, but it is basically the opposite of a breaker, but they are still both mitigation in essence. Now, we have a high, a low, and a higher high. No, lower high. You see that? That low between it is a mitigation block. If this high here was taken out with a higher run here, then that would be a bearish breaker. Bearish breakers are much more stronger in terms of resistance than a mitigation block. A mitigation block can be traded through. So in terms of how I use mitigation blocks, I typically side with using them as targets more so than entry because they can be traded through. Breakers are kind of like, they're, they're pretty formidable in the path of price action. It doesn't mean that they can't go through them. It doesn't mean I've never had a losing trade using a breaker because I have. But mitigation blocks are better used for targeting purposes. I was using this one here with the expectation that the NASDAQ could try to gravitate towards that. If it were to go any higher, this small little fair value gap there and obviously the buy side above it. So I have not called a high in the NASDAQ or ES. In fact, you've heard me emphatically state many times throughout the commentaries and or Twitter that I am not calling a high. And it's important for you not to try to do that too. Look how it just keeps drilling higher. It's grinding people down. Anybody that wants to sell short this market, and believe me, I'm in the, the opinion as well that there's no justification for the markets to be where they are, at least for equities. You know, stocks should not be trading where they're at. But we have to trust order flow. What kind of order flow? The things I started to show you in the beginning of this presentation, I don't subscribe to those things. I don't have any faith in them. My faith is based on where I believe the market's going to go. So yes, I believe I'm pretty good at predicting where price is going to go because I have experience doing it and I have tools to help me to do that. And I also can see where orders are going to be anyway. Before your ladders, your depth of market, before your footprint confirms what I already and my students already expect in terms of price delivery, we already know there's going to be buying and selling between the two price points that we're at. That, that's a given. So knowing where the market's going to go to, that's a directional bias. You Listen, you, at some point, folks, unless you trade options and you're delta neutral, you have to have a directional bias. There's no way around it. You have to. Otherwise, you're writing options. So if we're trading futures and we're trying to be a buyer or seller, I mean, if you're going long, then you have a bias that's going higher. So why, why argue with that? Why call it something that it's not? You're predicting price. You're trying to predict the price. Then say, we don't need to predict the future price direction. Well, yes, you do. If you want to be profitable, or at least consistently profitable, like you have to have an understanding of where 
the market can gravitate towards. And that's what I teach my students. That's the first thing they come out of the gate with with me is knowing where price is likely to go. If you don't have that skill set, you will not be consistently profitable, period. End of story. There's nothing else to discuss. So my opinion was in the beginning of the week, I wanted to see us gravitate towards this mitigation block. It would be above the relative equal highs here that had already been cleared through here, and we consolidated. Markets don't top like that. Okay, And it was more likely that we we're going to expand higher. It did. It reached into the mitigation block. It actually closed right on it. So that's, that's rather decent, isn't it? So ahead of the week open on Sunday, July 9, 2023, we were expecting price to go higher. And we have this candle right here. Now, on this candlestick chart here in the lower left-hand corner, this is a daily chart of the NASDAQ. Everything that I'm teaching you here, folks, you may be primarily a Forex trader. Okay, everything that I'm teaching you right here works on every asset class. I would not do anything different. So that way, if you're frustrated because I'm not talking about Forex like I did a lot before, uh, I'm teaching through this medium here because this is where I actually got started. In 1992, I was a commodity trader. So this is where I started. Later on in, in my career, I moved and transitioned to Forex. There's a lot of things that prevent me from wanting to trade Forex, so that's the reason why I'm teaching with this medium here. Everything that I'm teaching you here with futures index trading works in Forex too. It works in commodity trading. It works in gold. It works in metals. And my students, I can't swear by it because I've never traded crypto, but I have students that have been profitable trading crypto using this information. So that way, at least you know that somebody else out there other than me has some experience with it because I don't have any experience trading crypto. So if we see this down close candle after, if you look at the weekly chart here, there's a small little fair value gap right in there. That's this one here on the daily. So the market traded higher there. And then we have this down close candle, which is right above and digging into this down close candle. This is an order block. It's bullish. This is a propulsion block. Propulsion blocks are order blocks by themselves, but the way you differentiate what they are and how they're used is this down close candle digs into a previous down close candle. So an order block that has another order block that digs into it. Propulsion blocks, you never want to see a closing price below mean threshold. Mean threshold on an order block is the 50% level. We wicked down through it, but then closed here. This one here, we wicked down through it and closed right here. We wicked down through it and closed up here. So yes, we had the movement through the mean threshold, but we didn't close below it. So that still keeps this down close candle valid as a propulsion block. I promise you we're going somewhere. Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Monday's trading. All of this movement here was just returning back into this gap, this tail on this candlestick. We treat wicks and tails on candlesticks as gaps. Midpoint of that gap or tail on that candle is consequent encouragement. Extend that out in time, you can see that's exactly where we were trading on Monday. It did not violate the rules that make a propulsion block invalid. Market closes here and now we open the next day. We open, trade down, rally back up and have an up close. So the next two days we had news. We had pretty good uh, economic calendar events for the rest of the week and it sent price parabolic above the relative equal highs. So the draw on liquidity is the weekly chart mitigation block. Okay, so uh, we're not going to say that that actual price was 15693 but we're just going to use it for the sake of discussion because I don't know it off the top of my head what the actual price was. I have it noted here. You're invited to do that in your own study. Don't just take what I show and talk about in the video. You need to go in there and weigh out whether your charts show the same thing because you want your own proof. You don't want to just take my word on anything. In fact, that's the best way to do it. Challenge 
yourself and challenge my observations. Was it really there in the chart? Because you know, just taking my word for it, anyone else's word for anything is, is not something you should do, especially in investing in financial advice. So this movement here, this was fully expected. We were expecting this bullishness in higher prices on NASDAQ. We were expecting it in ES as well, even the S&P. But we look for things to start or instigate a price rally higher or a price decline lower. And we frame it on the basis of where are we at right now versus where is it likely to go. So if we think that the price is going to gravitate up to this area here, and we'll call it 15693 and 0.75, if we start the week here, Monday and then Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, we expect each daily candle to gravitate towards that level. Even if you didn't pick that level, if you felt that this fair value gap was a reason to keep going higher, that's fine. That's nothing. There's nothing wrong with that. But this mitigation block is below that fair value gap. And if you are using the relative equal highs as a draw on liquidity, there's nothing wrong with that either. Remember, the only thing we're doing is primarily looking for the expansion either higher or lower on the weekly candlestick. That sets our bias for the week. So is it more likely to see where price was consolidating here? Is it more likely it's going to drop down after we've already went into this fair value gap here? We already did that. And then we consolidated here the previous week. And then we start a new week here, trade down a little bit, and then reject it, which is all that rejection is based on this consequent encroachment on this daily candle right there. That's where the low of the week was formed. So this is primed to just obviously expand higher. And aggressively above these relative equal highs on the daily chart. So there's buy orders resting above that. Markets don't top like this, folks. They don't do it. And since the weekly and the daily chart are showing this pattern, it's more likely to go higher, especially since we were bearish on dollar. Not just bearish a little bit, but we were exceedingly bearish, expecting it to reach for a larger pool of sell-side liquidity. So if that is the case, that means it's definitely a risk-on scenario, meaning all assets have the likelihood to go higher. Euro, pound, gold, all other asset classes are free to move higher because it's risk on. And we saw a huge risk on event this past week where most asset classes went up while the dollar crashed. Over here on the hourly chart, I want you to notice this little shaded area here. That's the propulsion block. That's this whole range here, but visible on a hourly chart. So we have relative equal lows here. We drop down into it. We trade above this short-term high right there. That's all it needs to do. That's a shift in market structure. It doesn't need to close above it. It just now sets the thing in motion that we're going higher. Doesn't mean you can't have retracements, but look where it retraces. If you take this propulsion block right here, and you divide it in half, that's mean threshold. That's what this drop was going to right there. It's going right there and it's also cleaning up these smooth edges in the bodies. Wait a minute, that's not smooth edges, ICT. Look at this wick right here or this tail. And look at this right here. Look at the bodies. The bodies tell you the story. That's the narrative. The wicks do all the damage. That's the stuff that everybody gets hurt by. You get stopped out and you don't want to go back into the marketplace. That's their, that's their purpose. Reading price action with a time-based chart and focusing on the bodies of the candles. If you just saw these right here like this and there was no wicks or tails on your candlesticks, if you took that completely off your chart, this would look like smooth edges. And that's all this was, trading down into mean threshold, which is the entire range from high to low. Split that in half. That's this level right here. That's occurring right in this level, digging into it after we had a shift in market structure. So what am I saying here? At this point, right there, that's slightly higher high than this one, because we've had sell side taken there. Now we have buy side. We're bullish. So we have now met the minimum criteria for high probability directional bias. So now we can absolutely predict higher prices. We can trust that higher prices are likely to go where? 
up in here, this mitigation block. So if we're looking for a 15,693 level, and we're down here, and we drop down to mean threshold, at that point, does the market want to rally away from it? Sure looks like it does to me. Tries one more time, digs into it, but look where the bodies are showing. They're showing it's respecting that propulsion block right there. We've already did the damage of going down into it, and here bodies are supporting the high end of the propulsion block. That shaded area and then we want to see does the market want to rally well here's the thing if you're looking at depth of market or if you're looking at uh, footprint you're going to start seeing all the things that would justify the market wanting to go higher we already knew that we already knew all those things and from here as soon as we get these candlesticks showing this and this candlestick closes the next candle here and it drops down and touches this the high of this blue shaded area, which is this candle, that range on the daily chart. We're working with the hourly chart here now. I know that we're likely to go higher. Where? We have all this sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency. So basically this candle six low. And then we have the buy side above this high here. There's buy stops resting above that. But this also is another pattern. It's a breaker. So I know that Everyone that uses a depth of market, uses a footprint, they're going to be looking for justifications to go higher or lower. The folks that would be looking at it with the expectation that the market's going to go higher, the evidence that they're seeking will be there. Every instance of it would be reflected in those tools. I don't need to see that. I already know that the market's going to go towards these levels. It's driven that way, not because of buying and selling pressure. I have already arrived at these ideas before the markets even opened up, before the market even printed its first book on Sunday's opening. We had already codified the expectation that these markets were going to go higher and to where. There was no need, there was no way for me to look at depth of market or a footprint to justify those things because the market hadn't already done anything yet. So while the markets were static, using experience, using institutional order flow, reading the tea leaves, okay, reading price action. So for the folks out there to say, you know, if you're reading the tape, so this is reading the tape, folks. You're watching price and how it gyrates off of my PD arrays. That's reading the tape. When someone says, show me your order book, show me your order book, that's the stuff at the beginning of this video that I don't need. Before your order book, before your depth of market, before your ladder in your footprint tools start telling you anything, I have already, I'm light years ahead. The footprint, that's something that is happened. This is where the buyers were. This is how many orders were bought and sold at these specific levels. Okay, that's wonderful. That's wonderful history. I loved it when I was in school. But who has a better perspective, folks? Okay, Someone that's ahead of you on the path that you're walking right now. Someone that is a quarter mile up the road. They've already walked this path multiple times, many times. They know the terrain. They know where the sticks are out and the thorns are. And who has the better perspective? You, as an inexperienced student of the marketplace. Someone that's new. Maybe you started in 2015. You're looking back and wondering, can you trust these tools? When I'm ahead of you in experience and I can read these charts without any of that stuff, and I know where you're going to see new buying ent entries and you're going to see retracements to take out liquidity, you're going to see inefficiencies and how they're going to use those inefficiencies. And I've proven this numerous times with live executions. I've called the market minute by minute live. On a live stream, not pre-recorded. You have all sat there and watched me do this. That is reading the tape. I don't need these gimmicks to talk about what's happened already. I don't need to see that order book. I'm going to tell you where the market's going to go before the order books talk about it. That's what my students are able to do. You may not have that skill set yet. You will over time. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen real quick. But I promise you, the idea of these things that are being promoted 
as this is institutional order flow. It's not institutional order flow. All you're seeing is a glorified time and date stamp. Time and sales. That's it. That's all you're seeing. It's a it's a repackaged edition of that same information. That's wonderful. That's wonderful for data collection and, and studying. Okay, it's wonderful. But you still are left with the puzzle of where is price going to go, higher or lower? And in between where we are at market price, how will it behave? Well, let's talk about that. If this is the propulsion block, and we've already seen it dig down into here, I'm not looking at ladders. I'm not looking at depth of market. I'm not going to look at that level two data. I'm not looking at anything harmonic. I'm not looking at animal patterns. I'm not looking at Elliott Wave. I'm not looking at GAN. I'm not looking at anything but this price action right here. Now, what's more simplified? Trying to determine the efficacy of a footprint, a depth of market, and then not trading with the expectation of predicting price to me that's that's insanity like how could you possibly know what to do and then it's not surprising when you see everybody out there that are trying to live stream and use these tools they fumble or they're not very confident when they're just you know, discussing what it is they want to do and one of the things i get challenged with is you know i i'm arrogant no i'm confident and my students that are profitable and that know what they're doing, they're confident. And it seems like arrogance to people that can't do it. And I'm just trying to communicate to you in a manner where I don't want you to view me as trying to be arrogant. I want you to learn how to do this yourself. If I was trying to hold it back from you, then I could see your argument. But I'm trying my best to teach it to you. And I'm trying to disarm you. For those that are standing here trying to arm wrestle me and say, you know, this is fake or you don't know what you're doing and it's always hindsight. When I have literally scores of executions and live streams where I've called these things before they happen. And your ladders and your depth of market and all this footprint stuff hasn't even spoke to you yet. I'm light years ahead. I'm ahead of you in the path. Okay. And I'm looking back at you. I know where I've come from. I've been exactly where all of you are. I've been there and I understand how confusing it is. And you're trying to determine what you're supposed to do with this information. It's a lot of stuff to understand. I understand that's normal. I didn't say it was going to be easy, but I will make it easy. And how I'm teaching you this year, there's no other way to simplify it. There really isn't. It's just you have to keep doing it for a while and you'll learn how to do it. But when I look back at you as someone that's starting, I have the advantage of knowing how price will deliver. I know how market structure will use specific things that I've dubbed PD arrays. You don't know where they're going to form or how they're going to form. I do. And I've proven that with live streams live with the lowest latency that YouTube can permit. So there's no excuses. There's absolutely no arguments. There's none. Order books are not advantageous to me. I don't need those things. And if you're learning how to do what it is I'm teaching you, you don't need those tools either. But if you want to use them to help you and you find advantages in using it, that's wonderful. I'm not going to tell you to put it down. But if we're expecting price to go up to this blue line and we're seeing evidence that all these things down here, stops have been taken, it's swept. We have all these bodies here, which is relative equal lows. Forget the wicks. Go back into the bodies. They're telling you the narrative. That's the storyline. That means they're going to want to sweep through it. There you go. It's happening right there. So when this is a full uh, bearish candle, I would be buying that. You probably wouldn't. Most people on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, and Discord, and things like that wouldn't buy that. They would be too afraid. They had no idea the price would react that way. But I'm leaning on this being a propulsion block. This is an order block that's already confirmed that it is. We broke through this candle's closure right here, which is a rejection block. It's showing a willingness to want to go higher. I don't need this high to be taken out. It's went above this one here while I'm bullish. This down close candle is a propulsion block. So that range I'm shaded here, I'm putting that and transposing that onto an hourly chart. So I'm watching price action on an hourly basis, how it performs. See, when I'm doing my live streams or if I'm doing a execution, and I'm recording my trades. 
I don't have four laptops, folks. <laughs> okay, I've I've had laptops, you know, numerous th uh, laptops over the years, and I kill them. I burn them out, and once they're done or close to being done, I take all the information off them, and they're dead. They're thrown away. There's nothing I can do with them. But I have many monitors in front of me on my system, and I've showed you that on my YouTube. I showed you my displays. I showed you what it looks like. And I'm watching different layouts. And one of the layouts I use has very similar to what you're seeing here, where we have multiple time frames. And I'm watching how price delivers on all of them. I'm not just staring at a one-minute chart. Can I trade with a one-minute chart entirely all by itself? Yes. But I'm not teaching you to do that because you're going to miss a lot of the information that like, I'm showing you here. You would not have the context of using everything I'm talking about here without having the daily chart, without having the weekly chart, the draw on liquidity, this blue line here. So when I'm looking at price, whether I have it on the chart or if it's on my notepad, because I'm using a notepad, unless I draw it out on the chart for you because you're going to watch the video later on, there's no, there's no annotations on my chart. Because I want my focus on where we are in that range. So on my notepad, I have the high, the low, and the mean threshold price point of that candlestick right there on the daily chart. And I have on my notepad, daily propulsion block. High, mean threshold, low. So I'm watching price when it's meandering around in here. I'm watching time of day and how it responds at those specific levels. Because I'm predicting, I'm anticipating, I am not reacting to anything. The only time that I react is if I'm wrong and I see the evidence in price action that I'm offside or am likely to become offside, then I'm gonna to react to that new information and say, okay, I gotta bail on the trade. That's the only permission that you're ever gonna get from me to react to price. Because everything else, we are absolutely predicting price. You are doing that, you're predicting the future. That's what this is. It's future. It's why they call it futures trading. Your lip. It's in the name. And why are you arguing, saying you're not trying to predict the price, or you shouldn't be trying to predict the price? You are. If you are bullish, that means you are predicting higher prices. If you're bearish, you're expecting and predicting lower prices. How are you reacting to anything? If you're reacting, it means you're chasing price. I'm not chasing price. I'm waiting for very specific things where price will walk into my crosshairs, and when it does, it's going down. I'm going to pull the trigger and I'm getting my entry. I have 81 ways to get in there. Trust me, I'm getting in there. <laughs> if trading was like a, uh, a cat burglar, I'd be the best one at it because I can get in it, bitch. So we have the mean threshold here, rallies back above, relative equal highs have been cleared here, and now the bodies are showing that there is an interest in seeing no further decline. Well, how, how do I know that? Because the bodies are not closing inside that blue shaded area. It's already done the work of doing what? Trading down into mean threshold. One more time, shifting higher. So market structure is now, again, one more time, bullish. So where's their inefficiency above this price point right here? When this candle closes, this one right here, when it closes, where is the draw on liquidity from that price point there? Well, you have this short-term high. So do you need... Do you need a depth of market ladder to tell you or a or book map or some kind of order flow application to tell you there's going to be buy order stacking above this this high here? Do you need that? Because I don't. You don't need that. That's reading the tape. Do you need to know that, that all throughout this decline here, while price starts going up, you're going to see all the orders above the marketplace being eaten into? Because that's expected. We expect that. We anticipate that. We're not reacting to that. We're not surprised and saying, wow, look at how the depth of market ladder is showing how all the orders just keep getting eaten and consumed. That, that's expected. That's reasonable. We expect that. We're not surprised by that. We're not surprised how we don't care what the number is either. I don't care what the footprint is saying, how many people bought this level and versus that. I don't care because my focus is on it's going to roll right back up this inefficiency which is a SIBI sell sign and balance buy sign and efficiency it's a classification of a fair value gap but then once it goes to this level here it's not done in my opinion because my focus is up here so I'm reading the tape I'm watching how it delivers all through here once it gets to this price point here I'm going to anticipate I'm going to predict this is where I would be in my live stream 
This is where I would be in my recording of my execution. I'd be typing out big range candles incoming. When it gets right here, right to that price point low, right there, I would be typing out, we're going to anticipate, we're going to expect, we're predicting, we're not going to be surprised by large up close candles. Why? Because it's going to make a quick run for the liquidity resting above this high. That's what the algorithm does, folks. That's what it does. You're not going to know that from the depth of market. You're not going to know that from the footprint because that's it doesn't have the ability to show you that. Experience reading price action does. So tape reading is where that skill set is derived from. Watching price action, how it behaves. I don't count the number of buys and sells at a specific price level. To me, it's irrelevant information. I don't care. That doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything to me. That's like saying, how many cars passed me on the left lane going to my destination this morning? I don't know. I'm focused on the destination, which is up here. I don't care how many cars pass me. As long as I have air in my tires, gas in my tank, and my engine running fine, I'm getting there. That's my focus. I'm looking through the windshield. I'm not looking in a rear view mirror, which is what footprint does. Depth of market. It's so short term in perspective. You don't need that. It's, it's built in the idea that if you know that you're trying to be long on a marketplace, it goes without saying that the orders above the marketplace should be eaten and eroded into. So where's the advantage in that? It goes without saying it's part of it. If the market's going to go higher, well, there you go. I don't care how many people are actually buying it because the volume, how many buying and selling has absolutely no bearing on my belief system on why price goes where it goes because it's algorithmically delivered. That's the problem that all of you have with me. You're all wrong. And you're wrestling, you're arm wrestling me saying, no, 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 this is what it really is. But you're not even coming close to the results I'm showing you. You can't even come close to the same precision that I'm showing you. You can't even call the market to the degree I'm doing on a weekly basis now. At some point, at some point, you have to sit down Lay down your pitchforks and your torches and say, you know what? Let me just listen to this guy and see where it takes me. That's all I'm asking you to do. You don't have to do it. But everything I'm telling you happens. I'm telling you what goes on in the marketplace and why it does. I'm literally teaching it to you. I'm not demonstrating toys. I'm teaching you how to do it. What you have to do to, to, to develop this skill set. It takes work. It's not watching a video. It's understanding what you're supposed to do and then go out and do it yourself. And it's going to feel like you don't know what you're doing in the beginning. But showing up every day in front of the charts, reading the tape, that means studying how it behaves without putting a demo trade on, without putting a live trade on, without trying to pass a combine on a funded account. It means simply studying what price does based on the time of day and day of the week. Knowing in advance, which I tell you where the market's going to go, it's going to go up or it's going to go down to a very specific level, not range, not zone. And you use that 30 years experience to trust while you're studying. So we have an ICT bullish breaker here. These are the instances where you see classic support and resistance ideas come in. And this right here, this is one of those videos where someone's going to come back in the future and say, see all ICT is doing, he's showing you classic support and resistance. And this is nothing new on the sun. No. <laughs> no, trust me, we're going to go deeper. I want you to think about why this level would be sensitive anyway. Because there's other highs to the left of this, and I talk about that on my market review that I did yesterday. So on July 15th, 2023, there's a market commentary or market review video, and I talk about that very instance. So I'm not going to take it any further than that because I already talked about it yesterday. But I want you to think about how the market from this high traded down and then traded up and then through it. What does that make this range from this low to that high? Once we broke out above this high here, which is what we were anticipating, we're not breakout traders. We're not reacting to price. We want to see that. But what makes this a very specific range? This becomes a balanced price range. What makes it balanced? We had a high. We traded it down. So 
sell-side delivery has been offered. Not sell-side liquidity. Sell-side delivery is any price run from a high to a low. We have had sell-side delivery from here and here, that, that range. Now, when we run right back over that entire range again, from that low up to that high, which is what we're doing here over time, as soon as we break through here, this high to that low is now a balanced price range. There is absolutely no reason to anticipate, expect, or want to see price come back down below that low. Why? Because the focus is up here, folks. We're expecting, we're predicting, we're anticipating the market to footprint its ass right on up to that level. We want to see that. We're expecting that. So where is the mile markers at going to be? Where's, where's, the, where's the rest stops along the way? Well, when the market runs above this area here, it's more likely to do what? Treat this level here as a breaker or a springboard to go higher. Why? Because this high has a lower low that's higher than this low over here. I'm not showing it to you because I want you to look at the commentary from yesterday. I talk about this on the hourly chart. So the market comes back down. Does it wick through that high? Absolutely. And that's permissible. That means it's allowed. We expect that. We anticipate that. We're not reacting. We're not scared by it either. Look where the bodies close. Right here. And it opens right there. So there are wicks that are going down into this buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency, which is a busy. It's a fair value guy. But what specifically stands out here? What is that? What's the segment between this high on that candlestick right there to this candlestick's high? What is this area? What is that? It's inefficient. But then when we see this candlestick here trade down into it, it erodes some of this inefficiency so it starts from here to here. This becomes a breakaway gap. We don't want to see that. We don't want to see that filled in. Are you telling me the ICT is teaching how to see, anticipate, and work with breakaway gaps? Yes. Now, did I say ICT invented breakaway gaps? No. When I first started learning how to look at price action and uh, John Murphy's book, which is the retail Bible for traders, everything in that book, if you know how to really trade based on what I'm teaching, you can turn it upside down. If you see that pattern that's taught in that book, and my concepts are calling for the opposite, that pattern in that book is going to fail. Ooh. Don't take my word for it. <laughs> Buy the book and challenge it. So, by the way, I don't have any uh, affiliation with John Murphy, so when you buy his book, I get no kickback. So, there it is. But it should be in every every trader's library because it really is the retail trader's Bible. They, they, all that stuff in there is literally exploitable if you understand what price is really trying to do. So we have this area here as a breakaway gap. The reason why it becomes a breakaway gap and why we would never expect the depth of market, the DOM, even if there was bigger orders below the marketplace here, okay, if there was a stacking of orders below that that were really large, okay, big, big interest to draw into that area down there, they're not going to go down there. Those things are not going to fill. What? Yeah. Yep. No footprints are going to be found down below that, that low right there because it's going to go higher because this area is going to stay open. Why should it stay open? Because it's running out of this range right here. It's already done the work of digging into this daily propulsion block. So this is why you cannot look at one candlestick chart one time frame and follow the narrative. You can't you can't be done, folks. Either you're taking in the information from the higher time frames and transposing them. That means placing whatever ideas that you think is supportive or counterproductive for your trade from a higher time frame. Whatever makes that trade idea you're under the I guess expectation is going to pan out. Whatever those ideas are from a higher time frame weekly and daily chart. They have to be on your tradable chart, either in some kind of annotation, some kind of you know line, or you know some kind of you know mechanism that draws your attention to it. Because if you don't have this information, 
If I didn't have the propulsion block shaded over here, you would not know what it is I'm talking about down here. What makes the context behind why it would be trading the way it is? You wouldn't know that. That's the only reason why I put this lipstick on the charts because you're learning from me. So I don't need this, but because I don't need it doesn't mean I shouldn't put it on the chart because if you're learning, it will help you. It's a crutch. It helps you stay organized from one time frame to the next. But my focus is up here. I want this to go higher. So I'm going to watch price reading the tape and look for all the evidences, all the signatures in price action that support that very thing coming to pass. I want to see periods where it's going to run aggressively higher. If I get that, then I'm going to be really trustworthy that I'm on side. That means I'm on the right side of the marketplace and stay with the idea. Do we get that confirmation with the body staying at or above this high here? Yes. Does this stay open? It's not trading back down into it. So where's the advantage there using depth of market or ladders or footprint? You would never expect this if you're my student. You're never expecting this area to be printed into anymore. But I promise you, and I've seen it, traders are looking at those things and they're expecting it to go down because they think this is an inefficiency now because ICT's talked about it. No, no. This is why you should not be listening to dollar menu mentorships, okay? You're going through the ICT drive through just like they are, okay? You're having the same experience they are. They're putting a price tag on something that they don't even know how to do yet. Learn how to do it independently. You don't need to pay for this stuff. So the market should be rallying higher. Where should it go? Well, where's the next draw on liquidity? Near term. Yes, this is it up here. But what above this high exists in terms of liquidity? Buy side. So your book map or your depth of market will start reflecting as we get closer to it. There's going to be a lot of orders resting at or just above that high. You need these tools to tell you that because I don't and my students don't need that either. This is reading the tape. This is what reading the tape is. It has absolutely nothing to do with the things I opened this presentation up with. So when you read or see or listen to these people out there, they'll say, you're talking about institutional order flow, or you're talking about reading the tape, show me your order book. No, 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 no. Show me you using the information from those tools and you calling the market precisely. Because that is lacking. I don't see that anywhere. I absolutely do not see that. I would love to see it. I would be entertained by it, and I would love watching the person, whoever it may be, that would be willing to do that. I am a person that loves to study a trader. I don't want to relearn anything. There's nothing else out there that would ever interest me that would ever be better than what my have. What I have here is the market. But I love watching how traders navigate the marketplace themselves. They manage themselves or mismanage themselves. It's, it's unfortunate sometimes, but it's very entertaining also when they're discovering themselves. And truth be told, sometimes I try to counsel them and tell them where they should focus their attention on how to correct it. And then many times it's not received in, in, in good spirits. I'm ridiculed or, you know, not given any regard for it. But, you know, everybody has their own prerogatives and their own choices. They don't have, you don't have to, you don't have to listen to me. But I'm the guy calling all this stuff before it happens. So the market right here has buy side. The market draws up into it. What happens before it gets to this run right here? Right here, this run right there. What happens? You see this wick right here? You see that wick? Half of that is what? Consequent encroachment. Interesting how it goes right down to it right there. Interesting how we have a gap right there with a wick. So if we have a gap like this with a wick, Always trust and allow for it's likely to go into this consequent encroachment, not just fill in that gap right there. So it can trade down, even though it goes over, over top that gap, the, the candlesticks high right here. If it went through that live, I would not be unsettled by that. I would not be scared by that. I would look for this candlesticks wick right here. The midpoint, which is consequent encroachment, we treat that as a gap. The market goes right back to it there. Then what does it do? Right back up here. All right, so when the next candle opens up, I would be looking at that and saying, okay, now I want to see it start expanding towards this high here. 
and I want to see it aggressively run through. I want to see speed. Well, we get it there. We come back down in. What is it doing? It's working inside this wick, which is what? A gap. We do gradients on wicks. 75% of the wick, 50% of the wick. We never want to see, in this case here, lower than 50% or consequent encroachment. So any respect of this wick should be limited to the high, 75% of the um, wick, and then consequent encroachment, which is half. So in my mind, when I'm watching price action over here, I don't want to see it go below half of that wick. Find that in Steve Nielsen's book. Go over here, look what it's doing. It's going down, but it won't breach on a closing basis, midpoint of that wick, which is consequent encroachment. That's tape reading. You can't see that in DOM. You can't see that in footprint. It, you're not even going to look for it. There's no reason for you to look for it because it's not in that theory. GAN's not talking about it. Wyckoff doesn't know anything about it either. So the market does what? It rallies above this high here. What's above that high? Buy side. Buy stops. Someone is chasing that lower when it's green. This is an hourly chart. So inside that weakness in that hourly candlestick, someone's going short. Where are they going to place a stop? Right above that high. So the market does what? It gravitates up to it here. And we drop down, respecting consequent encroachment there, and we rally. What do we do now? We start expanding aggressively towards that weekly mitigation block. This level right here. And we trade up into that level there, and then we consolidate. Markets do not top like this. So we have, what is this? What does this area right here become? Once we trade through it here, right there, what does this area or fractal and price action become? The same thing I told you this becomes, a balanced price range. From this candlestick's high here, up to this high, then back down, once we clear this high here, this whole shaded area becomes a balanced price range. I am not concerned about price wanting to at any time up here going back down inside this range so for stop loss management your stop loss can be anywhere in this range and feel pretty confident that it's not going to get there so how would i do it and sleep good at night 75 percent of that range if my stop is below that i'm comfortable with that some of you get crazy about how i'm using my stops sometimes they get really close to what you might be scared to do at the time when you're watching my executions and you're seeing it, you're thinking, man, this is crazy. I wouldn't feel comfortable because you just don't know. I'm teaching you right now. These are long videos. These are very dense, very demanding of your attention to learn. And that's expected. I didn't tell you it's going to be easy and watch a video and you know how to do it. I warned you ahead of time. It's going to take a lot of work, but it's something that it's worth doing because once you have this skill set, nobody can take it from you. They can make jokes about all they want, but they're never going to be able to do what you can do once you master this. So let's go into, now we have the hourly chart over here, and we have the balance price range there. And now this chart here is a 15-minute time frame. So we have the market trading sideways ahead of Friday. So we have this consolidation here, and then we have a market report that's due out on Friday. We're anticipating what? The market's not going to top like this. So we anticipate the market's going to do what? Spool higher, going higher, run higher. So at 8.30 when the news comes out on Friday, here's the five minute chart here, we have the market rally aggressively here, which is a buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency, which is the Long name for BISI, B-I-S-I. This is a fair value gap by classification. Specifically, buy side imbalance, sell side inefficiency. That means it's buy side imbalance, it's more upside, and it didn't go back and forth to offer sell side delivery. We get partial sell side delivery with this drop right here. In this segment and price action where I told you it's a breakaway gap, that's what I'm zoomed in here, showing you on a five-minute basis. But I want you to think about what is occurring here? At this time of day, at 10.30, after the news driver, we have this swing low here, and it breaks below that. This segment of price action right in here 
is a fair value gap. It's a SIBI, sell side imbalance, buy side inefficiency, which is the opposite of this over here. So it's offering the market on a sell side delivery, but there is an inefficiency on buy side. So we would anticipate markets like this to reprice up into this candlestick or higher and then reprice lower. Why? What time of day is it? New York lunch macro. So above this high we have buy side liquidity and it's entering the time of day where the lunch macro which is going to do what? It's going to run for liquidity. Where is the liquidity at for this time of day looking at this area here? It's below the lows of the morning. What is that? Right here. This is your, your swing low right after the news driver hits the marketplace. First swing low here. Everybody that went long or was long before this market report was out, they have their sell stop resting right below that. That's exactly what the lunch macro will do. It'll run from this fair value gap here, drop down aggressively, leaving what? Most of this portion of this open, which is what I've already talked about in the, a couple minutes ago, this is a breakaway gap. This line right here is this line right there. It's the breaker. So this high, that line, is this line right here on the five minute chart. This little segment of price action right there that's a breakaway gap, that's this little portion right here below that low. Okay, so that way you can find your way through the charts of what I'm showing you. If you're not doing this with your own analysis and toggling through, you know, scrolling through each individual time frame while you're watching price action, having every expectation the market's going to be going what? Going higher. So we're seeing even on the five minute chart, look at the bodies of these candles here. Are they closing below that breaker line, which is this candlesticks high right there. Even on the five minute chart, it's showing you what? That this is being respected. There's no necessity for it to trade back down into this area. So that will be a what? A breakaway gap. That indicates that we're going to see continuous upside delivery and it's going to draw towards the buy side. That's the next significant pool of liquidity. So throughout the afternoon, we see the market trade higher, come back down in, trade higher, come back down in, some random fair value gap here, and then gravitate, start moving towards the higher high again, which is this here. Okay, We run out of day during the day session. So all of this consolidation, when we resume at 6 p.m., because the market takes a, an hour break between 5 p.m. Eastern time to 6 p.m., when that occurs, when markets start trading again, the same premise we would have in, in our expectation, we're not reacting, we're anticipating and predicting price that will eventually gravitate towards this high here. So if you're an overnight session trader, say you want to trade in Asia, say you want to trade in London, you're using these ideas in conjunction with the day and time that you're trading. So where's the liquidity? The, the liquidity is not changing because you're ch trading in Asia. The liquidity is not hiding itself and becoming something different and morphing into something else because you're in the London session. Liquidity is there and it's going to gravitate towards that level. And if this context is here, we focus on moving higher. So let's go a little bit further in this. Here's that five minute chart. You can see how we gravitated here higher and now the end of the day and now starting a new day. So we start working towards what? All throughout Asia and then we get to midnight. Interesting enough, going into a new day at midnight, New York time, we ran the buy side here. Right there. Boom. Then we do what? We come back down. What's below here? Sell side. Stops. But I want to take you, before we go any further over here, I want to take you back into this area here. Focus on this little segment of price action right there. What time frame is this chart? You're looking up here. It's a five minute chart. Look at all the things here on this five minute chart. Do you see anything that stands out? We'll come back to it. But I want you to see in compare and contrast the price action on the five minute. We're going to drop down to a four, three, two, and one. But we're going to focus on this little area. And why am I focusing on this area here to shade it in? From this high down to that low and then how we start to deliver going back up. Because the, the trust is that there's no necessity to go back down into this area, which is a breakaway gap. Because this line here 
is your bullish breaker. Everything is indicating that order flow is supporting that idea. I don't need a ladder. I don't need a depth of market. I don't need a footprint. I don't need any of that stuff. You don't either. The time-based chart will tell you everything you need. It's simple. It really is simple, but you're trying to bring every concept that I've ever introduced into every discussion. I'm not doing that. I'm not bringing everything into this fractal here. Only things that stand out in this fractal. I can only deal with whatever PD arrays exist in this shaded area. So watch this shaded area. This is the five minute chart. Now we're going to transition into a four minute. Okay. Notice any changes in here. This is the part of the video you're going to want to go back and study independently or look at it from your own chart. Preferably, I don't know what time you're going to watch this video, maybe years later, but uh, I'm doing this for the purpose of that because you may not be able to recall this information on your chart at the time. So yeah, well, you can use my charts here and you know, screenshot them and do whatever annotation you want to do. Now we'll look at the three minute chart. Okay, Notice all this here. What is price doing? I don't need a depth of market to show you what I'm about to show you. It's a two minute chart. Same range, but it looks different, doesn't it? And then finally down to the one minute chart. Now, this green line here, again, is the hourly bullish breaker, that high. We dig into it here one, one, two, three times, and then we have a swing high broken to the upside. The last down close candle prior to that shift in market structure, that down close candle is a bullish order block. That opening price is a change in the state of delivery. Now, huge leap forward for people that want to learn order blocks. Okay. For the record, order blocks have zero. Notice I'm not talking about depth of market here. Notice I'm not even pointing at a ladder. I'm not talking about footprint. I didn't even talk about volume. I don't care how many orders were purchased or sold short in this candle. It's irrelevant. That has nothing to do with my order block. My order block, which is codified and created and authored by me, nobody else is the author of it. I didn't borrow it from somebody else and it ain't supply and demand. This candle right here, the open of that candle, the change in the state of delivery is when that candle sticks opening price is crossed right there for the first time. When that happens, then and only then, never before, never another time in the future, that validates this down close candle as a bullish order block. Now, why? What makes that an order block? The fact that we have this bullish hourly breaker, the fact that we traded down into it, and then we see a shift in market structure. Then we go back to the down close candle, the last one prior to a run higher that has a shift in market structure there. That is not a change of character. Rebranding. <laughs> Stop it. This is not an FU candle. This is not an engulfing candle. I don't care if this candle started here. It opened here and went down. Or if it opened here and went down, I would draw it right on the opening price. It has nothing to do with engulfing. It has nothing to do with anything else except for what I'm teaching you right here. Folks, anybody out there trying to teach order blocks, unless they're parroting exactly what I said in another video lecture, they don't know what they're talking about. Period. End of story. That's just the facts. This becomes a bullish order block as soon as that candle crosses it. What? The opening price. That's the change in the state of delivery. As soon as that occurs, this low should not be violated. So you can now start looking for bullish PD arrays that are in discount. Well, everything's in a discount now because we're so far down. But we have a down close candle right here. So we can use that opening price, extend it forward. Anything in there buying this anywhere in this area here buying buying that you, you can buy that with a stop loss right below there oh that's a little bit too wide for me then don't take the trade wait for another run higher and wait for an inefficiency wait for a fair value gap wait for a breaker wait for a 
institutional order furniture drill. Wait for whatever your model is suggesting that you should use. But look closer. We are now looking at that price range from this high up here all the way down to that low. We trust that that low will not be violated. Why? Because this candlestick was crossed right there. Now what happens? Let's pay devil's advocate. What happens if it breaks that low? Okay, then you have to continuously study price action and wait for that same instances where we see a shift in market structure to the upside. In the last down close candle, we'll mark the opening price. And if there's a candle that goes above it, that validates the down close candle as a bullish order block. This is only one form of my bullish order block. There are so many of them. And yes, for the folks out there that have a problem with me having all kinds of weapons in my repertoire, I'm sorry that I'm not a one-trick pony. I'm sorry that there's a whole lot of things out there, but you don't have to know everything I'm teaching you. You just need one thing, one thing, one concept, one model, and you can be profitable. And you don't need to worry about anything else I've ever made videos about. I don't know why you guys are complicating. You're complicating it. Not me. You are. <laughs> so we have the ranges here. 75% of the range is a gradient, 50%. And then 25%. So I want you to notice how as price works very close to 25% of that range, like in the range is the high to that low, we are trusting that it wants to go higher now because we have a change in the state of delivery. And when that candle starts moving above that opening price, now we have it. It's in place. We have a shift in market structure. All lights are green for going higher. How do we use this information? How do we read the tape? How do we discount the necessity for reaching for depth of market, ladders, and footprints. You don't need those tools. Look at price. Order flow. What kind of order flow? Institutional order flow. Easiest, right to the chase, no bones about it. Easiest thing is if we're bullish, we want to see down close candles support price. If we see a short-term low taken out, we expect to see that as a stop run and then price should revert right back into going higher right away. And everything I just said, reverse it for when the markets are bearish. It's that simple, folks. Watch. We have a down close candle here. Draw it out in time. Does price support at that level? Yes. 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 Does it start moving higher? Yes. Does it take out short term highs? Yes. Yes. Down close candle. Is price supporting it as a bullish order block? Yes. It's not going below it. Does price go higher and take out high? Yes, it does. We have a down close candle. Does price go down into it and reject that area and leave it and break a high? Yes. Do you need a depth of market ladder to tell you that? We expect the depth of market, the ladder, to start eating into those orders above the market price. That's expected, folks. We anticipate that. We are predicting that to happen. We expect that your candlesticks and your Renko bars and your algo bars and whatever the hell you're going to be using, they're going to start going higher. That's expected, folks. We expect that. We're not surprised by it. Down close candles here. Why am I picking this one? Because it's above this high here and this high here. So does it support price? Look at it. What happens when it hits it? It starts going higher. Does it take out a short-term high? Yes, it does. So is order flow bullish or bearish? It's bullish. What is it reaching for? A premium. Relative to what? The range, which is this high to that low. That is determined by this level here, which is equilibrium. At that level or below it is what? Discount. At that level or above is what? Premium. So when we get above this 50% level, it's far less probability, more risk, if we start taking order blocks and buying them above this level because we're in the premium range of this high to low. Doesn't mean it can't keep rallying. It just means that we have to do all of our buying below equilibrium or less while we're in a discount. That's the framework for high probability. Short-term lows being taken out, we expect that to be rejected and start seeing price go higher. We start to see it run higher here. Does it find support on this down close candle here? Yes. Sends it higher. Does it take a short-term high? Yes and yes. We have a down close candle here, right around equilibrium. 
No return back to it here. That's fine because that we're in an area where it's a short-term premium. Down close candle here. Look at the body supporting that idea. And then rallies higher. Highs are taken out. Down close candle. Does it support it as bullish? Yes. Higher. So when I'm watching price and I'm on one side and I'm expecting prices to go higher, I'm looking at every down close candle as a means or mechanism to support price. Or any swing low is a potential stop run. So I'm not in a hurry if I'm long to ram my stop loss between some random swing low because that's exactly what the algorithm is going to do. It's going to sweep below them like it does here, like it does here, and like it does here. And then once it does that, around equilibrium, then it's going to go into another price leg higher. And then we enter a consolidation. What's below here? Sell stops. Now we can go higher. Notice also that we have all of these fair value gaps right here and all this in here. When we have a change in the state of delivery and we enter a buy program, which is where we are from this point on there. Well, what's going on here, Michael? It's just retracing. That's all it's doing. It's allowing for a deeper discount with that low staying intact. When this high is taken out here, notice that we have another return back into this order block. When we have this retracing back in the order block here, that's when we start seeing the more pronounced run higher. But look what's occurring here. All of this imbalance here, what is it lacking? Buy side delivery, not liquidity, buy side deliveries when there is a run higher in price. Look what it's doing. It runs higher. Look at the bodies respecting what? The inefficiency is high right there. This SIBI, that candle's low. What is it respecting? This candle's low here. And then what is it dropping down into? Consequent encroachment, midpoint of this candle's low and this candle's high. There, rallies. Where's it rally to? The fair value gap right here. So what, how do we use this information? They're inversion fair value gaps. These are like a mountain climber. And the mountain climber is climbing up the surface of the mountain. And he's looking for those little pockets to stick his fingers into and stick his toes on to, to find footing and grasp a new finger point or holding point to pull his body up. Well, we're in a bullish market now. We're in a buy program. We're climbing a mountain. What's the mountain? This is the mountainside here. And this is the most sheer drop off. So this is the smoothest part in that drop off. So we have to use these areas to find what footing. There's little pockets. We have to wait for them to form. That means consequent encroachment, short term low, trades below. What's it going to do? Trade back into this order block and take out that short term low for sell stops. I'm not freaking out when I see that. I want to see it react at that order block and then also that it's taken out liquidity and there's also a volume imbalance right there. That's tape reading. You watch price, whether you're watching it live or you have to watch it in market replay, which is not going to be the same, folks, unless unless you can watch price delivery every individual fluctuation, which trading view is limited to the, it doesn't do that. Um, it's better for you if you can't watch live price action to, to re, you know, record your screens. I use Camtasia, which is a application from techsmith.com uh, t-e-c-h-s-m-i-t-h dot c-o-m that is the uh, the program that I use to record and make these videos you can set it to record the marketplace while you're at work while you're sleeping while you're at school whatever and then when you come home you can play back the recording and watch real-time price delivery and you, it's a wonderful way to do journaling if I had that resource when I first started, that's how I would do my journaling. I would make it in, in video format. And yes, it takes a lot of time. Yes, it would take a lot of time to, to manage it all. Yes, but all that time would shorten anyone's learning curve. But you don't want to put a lot of work into it. And you wonder why you're not getting the results you're looking for. So fair value gaps like this, if we're bearish, we expect it to go up there and sell off. But when there's a change in the state of delivery, we expect the market to go up. So all these down movements here, it's lacking what? Buy side delivery. So it's going to want to gravitate up into them. If it ever retraces into them, once it closes them in, we treat them as what? Inversion fair value gaps. So we see this consequent encroachment, which is midpoint of the shaded area, midpoint between this low and this high. Here, we rally up to what? This gap. 
we're treating it as an inversion fair value gap. Does that mean it's going to trade right here and go higher right from there? No, we have to wait and watch. What is this here? This is a buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency. What is this right here? It's a swing low. We've had a nice move outside of the range of these relative equal highs, and we're into two inefficiencies, this one and this one. And now we have a short-term low. It's probable, not guaranteed, it's probable that it's going to run for short-term sell-side liquidity. Stop hunt. That's what we get getting from here. It drops down, takes out that liquidity, also respecting consequent encroachment of this fair value gap. Then rallies. It rallies to this high and through this inversion fair value gap comes back down support support rallies back up what is it creating what's it creating here short term low so what's going to be trailed up right behind that sell side where are we at in the range from high to low here's equilibrium we're right there at equilibrium when this occurs Equilibrium is where you're going to anticipate, you're going to predict, you're going to expect a stop hunt. That's what the algorithm will do. Don't take my word for this, folks. Do not take my word for it. You go back and you look at old price moves. You're going to see this every single time, 100% of the time, every single time. And that's what you're seeing here, a run on stops. This one is two times. But returning back into what? This fair value gap, which is an inversion fair value gap. You would take this, extend it over. What is it respecting? This order block still, that's a reclaimed order block, but it's also in concert with this candlesticks low. It's respecting that old gap. So that makes this an entry off of what? This inversion fair value gap right here. The market finds support here, rallies. Takes out the high, takes out the high, and trades up into what? the next gap over here, which will be treated as what? An inversion fair value gap. So I'm looking at like a mountain climber here. I'm looking at all the potential finger holes where I can grab a hold to pull myself up higher. That's what price is doing. That's all price is doing, folks. It's so easy to understand when you try to lay down all the other stuff you're trying to bring into this. You want to bring in Elliott Wave stuff still. You want to bring in harmonic animal patterns that have absolutely no reason for expecting price to go higher or lower. That's a fantasy that's a religion don't bring gan into the discussion wyke off it, it, it's let the man rest okay he's not part of this conversation i promise you he's not when we drop down we're taking out sell side here and we're doing what we're rallying off of the low of this fair value gap so this candlestick's high that's what we're respecting everything look at the bodies it's telling you the story it's supporting the idea that that is still the underlying narrative. Stops have been taken. Control mechanisms are in place. The algorithm is absolutely respecting that old fair value gap right here that, again, Sam Seiden, we are cutting through candles because that's where the narrative is derived from. Inversion fair value gap for the win. Rallies. Order block. Touch it. Does it rally higher? Yes. Does it take out a high? Yep. Do you see what tape reading is now? Do you understand how we're working with time frames and we drop down to the lower time frames and we do not need any gimmicks to see what price should do? It's liquidity and inefficiency. It's discount and premium. Time of day. All these things come together to make a beautiful tapestry and you're never surprised. Once you understand all this stuff, you're not surprised. You want to see these things form and you're waiting for them to form. My profitable students see these things before they happen. The only thing that happens when they're watching price, they're not saying, oh my goodness, where did that come from? Why did that just happen? They're grinning before it starts to deliver. They know it's coming. They are grinning right now as they're listening to it because they know, nodding their head, yep, yep, because if we were all in the same room right now, and I said, raise your hand if you've been there before, all kinds of hands would be raised up. But you can't experience it until you had that experience. And you'll never have that experience until you go in and watch and study price action like this. I promise you, all the things I'm teaching you, they keep repeating. But you want something that's easy. Go out there and one, two, three, get me in, get me out, never have a losing trade. And I'm sorry, but there's no way to do that. I get it wrong sometimes. Sometimes. 
All right, so here is the back on the 15 minute time frame. So what happens once we clear this balance price range here? Remember we hit the bullish breaker line here. We have all these inefficiencies in here. What happens when we get above it? What can we do now? Well, we have a target up here. That's a draw on liquidity. And then we have now this old market structure high. So now we can take that range and draw a fib from that high up to this target. Now we have gradients. So now we're grading a, a future price swing that has not happened yet. As soon as this candlestick right here closes, now we run from high to target and we run gradients. And now watch what happens. Around the 20, I'm sorry, the, it, I have it backwards here, 75% or the lower 25% of the range between the draw on liquidity and the high that was broken. We don't think that the market's going to go down here. Why? Because this is a balanced price range. So we anticipate every instrument out there, every little gimmick, every little toy is going to say, oh, look, orders are getting eaten above market price. The footprint's showing that, look, it's it's bullish. It's absolutely bullish. Of course it is. It's going higher. So we have relative equal lows, and they sweep that. Where does that occur? In the lower quadrant of the range from this high up to that draw on liquidity, which is the weekly mitigation block. That's what this level is up here. Then we have consolidation. Where does consolidation form, ICT? Oh, well, I said it in the core content lessons back in 2016, and I taught it to everybody that was my private one-on-one -on -one student back in 1996 at equilibrium, 50% level right here. That's where consolidation is forming. And then what happens? A stop hunt. Lower time frames, look in there, you'll see it. Rallies up. Another time here, and what happens here at the upper quadrant? from the draw on liquidity to this high, we're anticipating new price points that surge higher. That's what, what I'm, that's what I'm showing you here. We rally up, then we take out the liquidity above that weekly mitigation block. Then we do what? We find some support at it. And then we consolidate going into Friday, New York session. That's where we're at now. This is a 15 minute time frame on Friday, and we're consolidating. Markets do not top like this, folks, especially ahead of news drivers. So, a market report, we're expecting prices to go higher. We've consolidated, we're part of a bullish run, and we're expecting capitulation to come in. And that's what we're seeing here. Market rallies aggressively. What are we, what are we seeing here? See this gap right there? Extend that through. That's what you're seeing. That's an inversion fair value gap. Explosive run to the upside. Retracement. Failed run higher. Back down into the sell side here for a TGIF trade. Let's take a closer look. Five minute chart on the NASDAQ. Here's that price run here. Then we have this buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency. We'll get to that in a moment. And then we run up, we have a blow off move, and then we break down. Where's the fair value gap in here? There isn't one in here. Not on this side of the curve. The curve is here and then down. So you have to use the imbalance on the left side. That's going to be an inversion fair value gap. Extend that through all the price action. That's what you're seeing here. And then you have a small little fair value gap there that I didn't want to draw any annotations on because we have the inversion fair value gap. I can point it out like I'm doing here. Trades up into it here. Then we break. This area here is a breakaway gap. We want to see it stay open. So why should it become a breakaway gap? Because we have had a shift in market structure there. We have a buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency. Why trade the NASDAQ and not the S&P ICT? I'm telling you right now. Relative equal lows, blow off move after the market has been going straight up all week as we were expecting it to. And then we have the inversion fair value gap. Is it respecting that? Yep. And then we break below the short term low here, below the short term low here. And where's liquidity at? Below here, sell side. But then we have this buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency. So any rally from this candlestick open up in to above this high, we want to see it stay open. What happens if it closes in? It's okay. I would still want to kick a short up there if I was watching live and the market breaks down. Doesn't get below the what? The bodies. So we still have this wick to contend with. So we retrace higher 
Up close candles consecutively, that's a bearish order block. Breaks down through it. Extend the opening price over there, that's a change in the state of delivery. Returns back into a here. And all of this consolidation is time distortion. It's not time for the market to do anything. It's not, it's not going to do it. It's already ran the low here, which is the lunch macro for New York. It's already did that. But we're not done. We have TGIF. It's Friday. So thank God it's Friday. It's likely to do what? 20 to 30% of the weekly range in terms of a retracement from the high of the week. Where's the high of the week? Over here. When can we trust that's the high of the week? When we see this element here, and then we start seeing everything start breaking down. This high is intact. But what happens if it runs up and goes higher? Then you're wrong. How's that for logic? You're going to get it wrong sometimes. But you have to have rules and things to, to work with to grow in your understanding as a trader. And this is what I'm sharing with you. What time does time distortion stop? What did I teach you? Post New York lunch, we start seeing 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. That's your PM session time. Then all of a sudden what happens? The market delivers a run through. Low. Lower low. Fair value gap. Trades up into it. Consequent encroachment of the low on this wick. Boom. Sells off. Hits the sell side liquidity and trades to the 20% level of the weekly candlestick. So from the high to the low, measure that and it retraces 20% of the weekly range in here. Blow out the sell, sell side and then close real close to which is not noted here, but look at the uh, commentary I did on July 15th, 2023, the video right before this one, and you'll see the TGIF levels and how to find them and mark them on your chart. This is all the details in, that was not in that presentation. This is what was in my trade idea that uh, wasn't cherry-picked. I elected to use the NASDAQ because it was more exposed to inefficiency here and it was much more energetic on the upside and much more energetic on the downside so it had a better structure than that of ES that was the reason why I did ES ES got real close to doing a 20% retracement of its weekly range if you still traded ES you still would have been able to find profitability doing it so it's not an argument about you know ES and NASDAQ which one you should have been in because they both offered the opportunity but NASDAQ I was in and NASDAQ was just a beautiful delivery. All right, and here's a one minute chart of that time of day. Here's the PM session. And I want you to see that inefficiency, that buy side of balance, sell side of inefficiency. Let me take you back up so that way you know where I'm pointing your attention to. This range right here. Okay. We're looking at a five minute chart. We're going to drop down into a one minute chart and look at price action from here to here. Okay, that's what we're watching. But in this shaded area right here, I'm going to put the gradients in 25, 50, and 75. We're going to look at this return back into that shaded area here. Okay, so here's the lower quadrant or 25% of the range that's shaded here. So here's the high, 75% of that range, 50% of that range, 25% of that range, and the low of it. So the market trades up into that. And we'll come back to that in a second. But let's go back up into here and look at some of the details. Right away, this should jump off at you. That's a breakaway gap. Why? Why should that be a breakaway gap? Because we are under time distortion. That means all of this back and forth price action is just marking time. That's the benefit of knowing how to use a time-based chart. I'm not getting fooled by candlesticks. I'm waiting for time. When does it start? Right there. 2 o'clock in the afternoon, New York local time because the market is driven by an algorithm. There's a time for everything, a beginning and an end, a pause, a consolidation and distortion where everything you try to do will chop you up. So you wait, wait for what? Two o'clock and then wait for displacement. What does that look like right here? Takes out that short term low, boom. But now we have what? We're late in the day. This shaded area here is the buy side and balance sell side and efficiency. We have moved away from the high and we moved aggressively away from the 75% upper 75% range of this shaded area. So I don't want to see this area come back into. 
I don't want to see it come back up and trade into that. But if it does, I would treat it as an institutional order flow entry drill. And then it's a partial entry and then sell off. Either way, it makes it a breakaway gap. So we don't want to see it trade back up above 50% or consequent encroachment of this shaded area here. And now we enter into another time of day. The 250 to 310 macro. My algorithm starts at 250 to 310 and will start spooling price running for the liquidity that has not been purged yet. What is that liquidity? The liquidity below the lows. The 7 a.m. New York session time, the 8.30 lows, the 9.30 to 11 lows, all of that is the draw on liquidity. And or, in this case, 20% of the weekly range. That would be anywhere in this area here. But we start to see this energetic price run, aggressive dropping lower. That's algorithmic. This, right here, just like I talked about earlier, when we ran up, you can use the fair value gap on the left side of the curve. And we're seeing that happen right there. If it would have been opening here, traded up right there, if I was wanting to trade short and I hadn't already been short, that would be an area where I would go short right there too. Then it breaks. This is a measuring gap. We don't want to see that filled in just like we don't want to see that. What makes this a measuring gap? Well, between this high down to this low, we're expecting that run. And about halfway, we're expecting a, a gap to form. When it does and it moves away from it, we are not expecting it to come back into that. That's a measuring gap. You have to know where the market's likely to draw to. If you don't have that skill set, you will not be consistent in your ability to define or classify a measuring gap. Breakaway gaps are just gaps when you want to see an energetic price run away from an area you anticipated prior to it running away. So you're expecting it to move lower? Great. When it finally does and it creates a gap like this, your first thought should be, okay, the first fair value gap after it starts to run, that should be a breakaway gap. We want to see that, especially if we've been in consolidation or experiencing time distortion. Time distortion is simply a matter of time between segments of time of the day where markets will start spooling. That's it. It's a very simple thing. It doesn't mean that you should understand it right away because I said that, but over time when you come back to these lessons like this or refer back to new future lessons that I'll talk about it, it'll make perfect sense to you. Just you haven't been exposed to it enough times to know exactly what I'm referring to. And the market finally rips below the sell side liquidity, does it multiple times in here, and then consolidates at the close going into 20% of the range of NASDAQ's weekly candle. All right, folks, so I covered a lot of stuff here, and I will admit rather openly that this is not one of those easy go out there and I can do what ICT just taught me, okay? But I'm showing you many things here. I'm showing you a amplified version of what we do by reading the tape. I've rung in macros. I've rung in time of day. I've rung in how we use breakaway gaps and measuring gaps and how we anticipate price action and we don't look for ladders, depths of market, footprint or any of those things because we're anticipating price performing a specific function. We understand order flow. What kind of order flow? Institutional order flow. Institutional order flow is going to be based on the things I'm showing you here. Price is the thing. That's the that's the context. That's the that's the prize that we seek. The better understanding of that you can take the open high low and close of every interval and beat it up, torture it with number crunching and have it come out with all kinds of supposed insights, some kind of mathematically derived you know, indicator. Or you can take the past and say, okay, this is how many contracts were bought or sold at this price and therefore I believe this or that. Or you can look at a range above the marketplace price or below the marketplace price and determine, and there's a larger range of, or number of orders above the marketplace than that of below it. And you might think that that is indicative of wanting to go higher. Not always. Think about it. What happens if you're in these types of situations here, where you're right before the market is going to start going lower, but your depth of market, your ladder suggests that there's a lot of orders just above the market price. You might be convinced by looking at just that tool, thinking that, okay, it should start going higher and eat into that number. No, 
that might be just a large pool of smart money's stop loss that isn't going to be tripped, that isn't going to be eroded or eaten into. And then you watch price run away and you're thinking to yourself, wow, look at that rip. Wow, look at that. Where'd that come from? What just happened? Somebody must be talking. All these things, folks, all these things come out of the mouths of people that just don't know how to do this yet. And I want them to learn. That's all. I want them to learn just like you. I want them to understand how they can capture these types of price runs and not hurt themselves in the process. So hopefully you found this one insightful. Hopefully it was edifying for you. And until I talk to you next time, be safe.